group, uh, which is a coalition of over 70 organizations from around, around the world that are all committed to improving nuclear security. Uh, the panelists today are all members of this group, and we convened this panel to discuss the nuclear security summit that occurred in The Hague last week. Um, it's really a central event in nuclear security today, and we just wanted to focus a little bit on the key questions and um, results that came out of that summit. So Sarah Williams will speak first. Um, she's going to talk about what the nuclear security summit process is um, and some of those specific results. Sharon Squassoni is going to discuss the summit's uh, fissile material, fissile material re related accomplishments um, and also what gaps there are in the current agenda. Um, finally, Kenneth Luongo is going to discuss the future of the summit process and where it needs to go in the next couple of years to uh, really accomplish the goal of preventing nuclear terrorism. Um, and just to get, let you know a little more about the panelists, Sarah Williams is uh, a nuclear policy analyst at the Partnership for Global Security, and she's actually back at an old stomping ground here at the Center for Strate Strategic and International Studies. <laughs> um, she was previously a program coordinator and research, research associate here. Um, Sharon <laughs> is our wonderful host here, the, pro uh, the director and senior fellow at the Proliferation Prevention Program. She's also on the FMWG Steering Committee uh, she previously worked at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and advised Congress as a senior specialist in weapons of mass destruction at the Congressional Research Sur Service. Um, and before that, she had some experience in the executive branch uh, in the Department of State. Um, and Ken is the president and founder of the Partnership for Global Security. Um, he's also a co-chair of the FMWG. Uh, before founding the Partnership for Global Security, he was with Princeton Princeton University's program on science and global security. He also held several senior positions at the Department of Energy, including as a senior advisor to the Secretary of Energy. And prior to these positions, he served as professional staff for representatives on the House Armed Services Committee. Um, and I just wanted to give everyone a quick reminder, this is all on record and it's being webcast. Um, and also please turn off your cell phones or make sure they're on silent. Uh, Sarah. Would you ready to start us, start us off? Yes. Um, thank you, Leslie, for that lovely introduction. Um, as Leslie said, I'm just going to give an overview of the summit process, how it came to be, and sort of what's been accomplished to date, and, and go into a little more detail about what happened um, just last month in The Hague. So the nuclear security summit process really began in 2009 with President Obama's now famous Prague speech um, in which he declared that he was committed to cooperating with the global community uh, to secure all vulnerable nuclear material um, within four years and this became known as the four-year goal. The first summit was held here in Washington in 2010, the second in Seoul, South Korea in 2012, and the third just last month in The Hague, Netherlands. Um, the likely final summit will take place somewhere in the United States in 2016. Uh, the summit itself is narrowly focused on nuclear security. It doesn't um, address broader disarmament uh, challenges and ongoing arms control discussions. Um, in 2010, the summit really focused on fissile material. And in 2012, uh, that agenda expanded to include radiological material and also the safety and security interface, which was very important in the um, aftermath of the accident at Fukushima. In 2014, uh, countries really started to discuss what the legacy of the summit process would be, what, the, um, what we could do to sustain the progress that had been made so far and sort of what the, the future would look like after the final summit in 2016. One of the really important characteristics about the NSS has been the way countries commit to additional action and the way they report on these um, activities. Um, a really important thing to note is in Washington, coming out of the Washington summit in 2010, we really had three documents to look at. And following the 2014 NSS, just last month, there are dozens of documents on the NSS website and I would highly recommend uh, checking out. The, uh, the Dutch have done a really good job of catalog um, cataloging all of that information. Um, and so there's really a whole lot of information coming out that's public now. And 
to give an overview, each summit has produced a consensus communique. Um, that's what the countries can agree to together at the end of, and it's announced at the final press conference. In 2010, there was a Washington work plan, um, which has been, which remained relevant and been updated throughout the process. Um, in both 2012 and 2014, countries produced national progress reports in which they specifically um, accounted for different activities they had taken to further the goal of preventing nuclear terrorism. Um, some countries make their national statements readily available, but not, not all of those are always um, accessible. And countries have made, in different ways, unilateral and multilateral commitments um, that support the overall summit goals. And the multilateral commitments are what I'm going to focus on primarily. Um, these commitments can be vague, and they don't always have specific timelines or details about what a specific action is going to be taken. And the reporting mechanisms have not been uniform, and the reporting isn't required. Um, but I think it's really important that, uh, to remember that the fact that countries are taking the time and making um, statements beyond the consensus communique is really important and makes this summit process unique. Um, it's allowed for outside groups like ours to evaluate progress that's taken place. And also, in some ways, um, more reluctant countries have essentially been peer pressured into doing a bit more and, and joining into some of these multilateral statements. Um, in 2010, uh, at the beginning of the summit process, countries arrived to the Washington summit with lists of accomplishments that they had done within their national borders. Um, that they presented to the group. These became known as house gifts. Um, countries also at that summit uh, made statements outlining what they would do in the future to further the summit goals. Um, by 2012, more than, or, or uh, almost 90% of the commitments that were made in 2012 had been accomplished. And that was something that we found the first in the PGS ACA uh, commitment report series um, judged that, and, and that was the number that we that we found. Um, also in Seoul, a new type of commitment came came out of that summit. Forty-two out of the fifty-three participants in the Seoul summit signed on to at least one of thirteen joint statements. These joint statements were multilateral. Um, statements that laid out specific actions in priority areas to improve nuclear security. Um, these became known as gift baskets. So we had the house gifts, with, which are the unilateral national commitments, gift baskets, which are um, self-selected groups of states committing to further action in a specific area. These gift baskets covered a wide variety of nuclear security areas, including transport security, national legislation implementation, um, and information security. Last month in The Hague, this model was built upon. Um, six of the statements from 2012 were updated, um, and five of them had new signatories. So these are countries that previously did not join these statements, put their names to them in 2014. The transport security gift basket, to provide an example, this was one that our most recent um, ACA PGS report, which you can get outside, um, which goes into detail about the 13 joint statements, this was one we identified as having that structure, having a timeline, and sort of laying out specific deliverables. And those were the types of gift baskets that we found to be of the most value. Um, the transport security one was updated in 2014, and the countries that signed on to it committed to continuing their cooperation through the 2016 summit. There were six entirely new gift baskets in 2014, um, and the radiological security gift basket, which was presented by the German government in 2012, was sort of revamped and, and represented um, in a different format by the United States in The Hague. Six of the statements from 2012 weren't updated, but many of the countries that signed on to those in Seoul presented their progress in their national progress reports that they, that they um, submitted to the, in The Hague. Three of the new statements were essentially um, proclamations. One highlighted the achievement of removing HEU from 12 uh, summit participant countries. 
One called for the nuclear security agenda to be better integrated with the broader non-proliferation and arms control goals. And one reaffirmed country's support for the United Nations Secu Security Council Resolution 1540. The, the other new statements really did have some specific goals, which, which is wonderful. Um, the Dutch presented work um, that they have done to improve communication, best practices, and training in the area of nuclear forensics. One of the outputs from this was a, a mobile app, which uh, you can download, and it's great. I have it now. Um, it's a little dictionary. It's called the Nuclear Lexicon, and it's, um, it's a, basically a dictionary that is, going, that is meant to facilitate communication between experts around the world that are working on nuclear forensics investigations so that everybody is using the same language. The statement on maritime security committed the countries to participating in a workshop that will um, discuss how, ways to improve security for um, material outside of regulatory control, and that will take place before the 2016 NSS. The US-led radiological security gift basket commits those 23 signers to securing all category one radioactive material um, according to IEA guidelines. <clears throat> Finally, um, gift basket that got quite a lot of attention is the Strengthening Nuclear Security Implementation, which is also known as the Trilateral Initiative. It was presented by the three summit hosts and commits 35 of the summit participants who signed it to implementing existing nuclear security recommendations, encouraging, encourages peer review, and there, it actually lists more than a dozen specific actions that countries can take to demonstrate their responsibility in this area. Um, it was the most popular ever to have been presented, and um, it really will likely be the foundation on which we build sort of between the 2014 and 2016 summit and start to think about what the nuclear security regime will look like beyond 2016. And I'll let Ken speak a little bit more to that when, it, when his turn. So thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. It's nice to see so many people <coughs> interested in nuclear security and the outcome of the summit. Um, I am, uh, as Leslie mentioned, going to talk a little bit about the fissile material accomplishments. Um, also, I'm going to talk a little bit about the industry summit <clears throat> and uh, gaps. So Sarah made an important point when she said, you know, with these national progress reports that this is really the first time that we in the civil sector, civilian, what do we call ourselves? Civil society. Civil society, that's what we are, um, have an opportunity to really assess what's happening. The, you know, when you look at the, the physical protection of uh, nuclear material and facilities, all of these things uh, designed to combat nuclear terrorism, uh, there's a tendency, almost a knee-jerk tendency, to be secretive about it, right? Because you don't want to reveal too much information lest you give terrorists the upper hand. Um, and so, I don't want to, I'm going to say a few critical things about uh, the, the scope of what's out there, the magnitude of what we haven't covered, but I think we have to bear in mind that there have been some real accomplishments since 2010, and part of that is getting governments to open up about what they're doing and getting them to focus, spend money and effort uh, on strengthening nuclear security, and Ken will go into uh, sort of, we'll take the, the picture, the view from 30,000 feet and where we go forward, I'm going to focus right now on, okay, what's been going out and uh, what's been going on in fissile material. Um, also, I just want to, one more caveat, there's a lot of stuff that happened in the summit, right? When you go through each and every national progress report, it, it has a lot more than just, you know, to do with just nuclear material, right? There's a lot of training going on. There are, you know, centers of excellence. There are university programs that are being um, established to help train people. So bear that in mind. And I also want to just give the URL. I think it's, is it nss2014.com, which is the Dutch uh, official website. So definitely go through all the documents on there. Um, 
worldwide, there's still a lot of material out there. There's 1,390 tons of HEU. By the way, about 1,300 of those tons are in the US and Russia. Um, and there's 230 tons in military plutonium and 260 tons, this is separated plutonium, right? Not plutonium and spent fuel in the civilian sector. So that's the magnitude of the problem. I think it's pretty safe to say that we have a lot more work to do. <laughs> and one of the key um, takeaways is, you know, did we meet the four year goal? No, but do we have a better consensus about the fact that we need to focus attention on this? Yes. And so as we move forward to 2016 and beyond, we're really going to have to think hard about where do we want to go and what are the best avenues for leverage. So <clears throat> from this summit, clearly I think uh, the biggest accomplishment in fissile material is Japan. Uh, Japan relinquished uh, 500 kilograms of weapons usable material from its Tokai fast critical assembly facility. 300 kilograms more or less uh, were plutonium. The rest were in highly enriched uranium. Uh, this was material that, um, you know, some of it was US and UK origin. There was a joint statement, which you can look at on the website uh, between the US and Japan uh, about how to handle that, that material. The material hasn't gone, right? You know, but it's, it's a commitment to take care of that. But Japan is also doing other things. And if you read its national statement closely, you'll see that it's, um, exploring the conversion of fuel at the Kyoto University research reactors, uh, looking at the downblending of highly enriched uranium from the uh, University of Tokyo reactor and from the National uh, Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, and also shipping highly enriched uranium from the Japan Materials Testing Reactor Critical Assembly. So they don't get, they might not have got as much uh, media play as this 500 kilograms of material, uh, but I, there's still more going on there. Now, you could sit back and say, well, Japan has nine tons of separated plutonium. There are a lot of issues there, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit after I get um, done with a sort of country assessment. Um, there was less material. The two other countries that gave up material were Belgium and Italy. Uh, in Belgium's progress report, they say they transferred to the U.S. a significant quantities of HEU and separated plutonium. I don't personally know how much that is, and the national report didn't say. Uh, Italy apparently transferred 20 kilograms of HEU and plutonium. You can expect to see less and less of this material, you know, as, these, as this process goes on, because we're actually making progress. Um, so I don't want you to think that the assessment should just be on, okay, each summit is giving up less and less material. Uh, you ha need to think about it a little more broadly. Um, I also wanted to bring your attention to um, two other countries. Uh, one is the UK and the other is China. Um, the UK is uh, working on defueling and decommissioning its last remaining civil HEU reactor in 2014. Um, their national report did not mention the 20, over 21 tons of HEU they have, uh, 3.5 tons of military plutonium, and 91.2 tons of civilian separated plutonium. So even though these national progress reports, yeah, you have to look at this as a, you know, a work in progress, right? I think the national progress reports are a good step. They are not consistent <laughs> across the board, and this has been a, a discussion that we've been having for years. You know how much do states, states get to choose what they say in these reports so far. They're not mandatory. Um, China has done some good things. They decommissioned two research reactors that are fueled with HEU. They're converting another. Um, they didn't mention their civilian uh, or military stockpiles of HEU or plutonium. Um, they are a party, as is the UK and Japan and several other countries, to these international plutonium management guidelines. but. Even there, when you look at those reports, it is very uneven in the consistency, in the quality of the reporting. So I think China um, could do a lot more in terms of um, sharing information and assurances, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we shouldn't call it transparency, because that word is anathema, but um, in terms of providing assurances on, on the amount of material that they have. I want to mention briefly 
<clears throat> the Nuclear Industry Summit. And here, um, you know, I attended the first Nuclear Industry Summit in 2010. Um, and it's been a learning process, I think, for them. This is not really um, something that industry does. As one industry uh, official said to me, you know, we, we have meetings to get together and, and do real things, to make real decisions. <laughs> so uh, they're coming along. They are. Uh, there, I, I looked at their communique, and um, they reiterated their commitments to minimizing HEU, of course, with the caveat where technically and economically feasible, which is um, a big enough gap to drive a truck through. Um, the, the government sectors haven't done better than that. That's the official summit language. Uh, they did also say they would expand the use, they committed to expanding the use of LEU targets for radioisotope production. There was also another caveat uh, with that. But there were some new commitments, and I counted three. One was fostering the development of high-density fuels. Um, this would be to replace these HEU fuels. Another was ensuring the diverse supply of uh, it's 19.75% enriched uranium, so it's just under that HEU threshold. This is what a lot of research reactors use. So they're trying to diversify the supply of that and also have um, a viable disposition route for low enriched uh, spent fuels from research and test reactors. I think that's a very positive um, development. And then lastly, and I think this is really interesting because this is where industry can really help out. They're uh, committed to accepting the return of, now they call it disused sources, spent sources, radiological sources, that they supply. So these are the suppliers saying, we're going to take these back. Um, and they're also going to assist the holders of those sources with the logistics and financial arrangements. So that's good. So if a country says, or a hospital says, I have the source, I don't know how to dispose of it. Industry is actually going to take an active role in helping out with that. And where they can't take it back, they're going to engage with states on creating central facilities for managing those disused sources. So this is the other side. We were talking about fissile material. Now we're talking about the radiological sources. It's, you know, these are spread all over the globe. There have been some very high um, uh, highly visible incidents like in Guyana many years ago where children uh, died because they were playing with these radioactive sources. It, it's, um, it's a big problem and I'm glad to see that they're getting involved in it. Okay, so where are the gaps moving forward? Um, obviously military material. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of military material out there and as I said much of it is in the Russian and US stockpiles. Um, it's not clear to me that this process is going to be able to address that. But we in the civil society <laughs> can come up with recommendations for, you know, if it's not going to be the nuclear security process, we need to come up with uh, another process that can make some progress. We've been talking about for 20, 30, 40 years a fissile material production cutoff treaty. Um, you know, that's languishing behind everything else in the the disarmament and non-proliferation agenda. But maybe we need to focus on this because if you care about climate change and you think nuclear energy ha is a way of helping m mitigate or combat climate change, then you need to get really serious about safety and security across the whole spectrum. Um, on targeting outstanding material, so the summit, so we're talking about gaps here, there are a couple countries that um, have material that uh, we need to address. Belarus uh, was not part of this summit. One question is, should they be part of the next summit? South Africa, if you read its national report, it mentions conversion of the safari reactor, makes no mention of its HEU stockpile. Other countries, if you read these reports carefully, you'll see, and I'm not picking on Switzerland, I'm just giving it as an example. Um, their statement says, we recognize that these materials require special uh, precautions and therefore we're committed to reducing their stocks to a minimum level consistent with national requirements uh, in particular for R&D and training. Is that a bad statement? No. Uh, does it create a lot of flexibility? I would argue yes. And if you look at all these you know, country statements, you'll see similar things there. Um, looking forward. Uh, 
you know, we focused a lot on capturing HEU, not so much on plutonium. Uh, and so I mentioned earlier Japan. Well, Japan has a p policy of not possessing excess plutonium, uh, but when you start to look more closely um, at how that is being implemented, there are a lot of questions that can be raised. You know, the plutonium utilization plans are done by the utilities. They're assessed by the Japan Atomic Energy Commission. That Japan Atomic Energy Commission, you may know, has been recently downsized. There used to be five commissioners. Now there will be three. Um, and the, the question is, all right, this is a national sovereign issue, but it's a big one. And a lot of countries will be looking at how Japan does. Um, the Fissile Materials Working Group had, uh, we posted recommendations on plutonium policy. I'm kind of, um, I haven't been keeping track, but I'm sure I'm over my time limit. Um, Basically, uh, I'll just say, you know, we looked at, okay, what would be our recommendations on stocks, on production, and on military stockpiles? Some of these are, um, you know, I would say need more specificity going forward. I think we're all as a community going to have to address this um, more directly. It's not a topic since the 1970s. It's not a topic that governments feel comfortable <laughs> addressing. Um, but I think we need to have more input there. And then lastly, my one last point on the, on the gaps would be security culture. You know, in the Seoul Summit, there was a full paragraph in the communique on security culture. In this Dutch communique, it was kind of relegated to a statement, you know, saying we support the development of security culture. I know this is not a materials issue, but ultimately, all of that stuff, training, centers of excellence, you know, it boils down to are your people aware, engaged, and, you know, committed to making this a high priority. So um, uh, I'm sure uh, this was just a, a, minor, um, a minor omission or it was sort of went along in the negotiations on the, the broader issues in the communique, but that's my report. Thank you. Ken? Thanks, Leslie, and thanks, Sharon, for hosting us. This is one of the nicest places we've ever been <laughs> hosted outside of the Netherlands a week ago. So we're becoming classier, I think, as time, <laughs> as time goes on. Um, so my take on the Hague Summit um, is that it was a useful and important pivot point uh, for the future in several ways. And, and I think that the outcomes were positive and I think it was a useful event. First, there was a significant focus on the regime or what is called in the documents the architecture. But basically it was, um, there were both in a communique and in this thing called the trilateral initiative that, that Sarah referenced, um, a lot of discussion about the regime or the architecture for nuclear security and what we ought to do about it. And I'm going to talk about that in more detail in a minute. The second major pivot is that it was clear from what I read um, that this process is going to shift, I don't say downgrade, but it's going to shift to a more quote unquote sustainable model. I think this is something that Obama said. Uh, and the heads of state will still be involved some way, but it's going to be, I think, more of a ministerial and technical uh, level interaction um, from here on out. Uh, it also seems in that regard that it will remain a political process that's parallel to the IEEA activities, which I think is a positive development. Third, I was really interested to see that um, President Obama said, we need to finish strong. I mean, I could not agree more that we need to finish strong. The question is, will we finish strong? Um, what he's talking about, as I understand it, is identifying actionable items for 2016 and then, in his words, marshalling the political will uh, to achieve them. So I think that if he can play a role in that, we might actually make some progress. And then finally, the fourth pivot is, it, I think there's going to be more of a focus on demonstrating accountability. Uh, the trilateral initiative um, had 35 sponsors, as Sarah said, uh, and they agreed to do a number of, of useful things. Um, what they have to do now, though, is demonstrate between now and 2016, or by 2016 summit, the implementation of what it is that they've agreed to. There was a, 
Uh, not everybody's statement is online, but, uh, and I don't think the Australian statement is online, but we were given some information about the Australian uh, Prime Minister's statement, and he made four points that I think are actually very, very relevant as goals for 2016. High standards of security for all material. A strong nuclear security architecture with no gaps. Uh, build up an international confidence in nuclear security and cooperation among key stakeholders, government, industry, and NGOs. I think those four points are really important because if you look at the communique, as usual, there's a shout out to the industry summit, but poor civil society is left unmentioned after all of our hard work. So, <laughs> In my view, between a communique and a trilateral initiative, I think the summit actually covered a number of key nuclear security governance issues. And it covered a lot of the issues that, that we in the, in the expert community had been, um, had been promoting over the last couple of years. And I think it's a positive development. So let me just outline um, four, I would say, key issues that generally most experts on the outside agreed needed to be addressed and then, and then try to ex, um, assess how the summit did on each one of these things. So the universalization of the current regime is one of the key ones. Second, building confidence through information sharing. Third, employing voluntary actions to improve the system. And fourth, using peer review and, and best practices as a tool for improving um, overall nuclear security. You know, there are other ideas like the framework convention that, that we're promoting um, and that our group, the Nuclear Security as Governance Experts Group, is promoting. Um, uh, but let's leave that aside um, for the moment. And let me just go through these four. I think on universalization, uh, both the trilateral initiative and the communique made attempts to move this issue forward. So the communique made reference, to, as usual, to all the legal instruments and the IEA recommendations and guidance. But the trilateral initiative is specifically focused on the commitment to meet the intent of these IAEA recommendations. Now, meeting the intent of the IAEA recommendations is always, a, is, I guess, a little difficult. It's not exactly clear what the intent is. But I think the idea is to implement them as fully as possible. And I think that you've got 35 of 53 countries that signed up to this. And so that, to me, is the beginning of something more concrete. Uh, because previously, all we did is say IEA guidance in the communiques. We haven't had anything this specific that calls out the specific um, IEA re um, recommendation documents. Second, building confidence in information sharing. It also was referenced in both of these documents. So there's a new paragraph in the communique. It was called paragraph 20, infamous paragraph 20, on voluntary measures. Um, and it offered a range of specific ideas for countries to undertake, including sharing non-sensitive information. It also stated, I thought interestingly, that showcasing nuclear security efforts, i.e. making information public, um, can also build regional and international confidence. The trilateral initiative doesn't specifically talk about confidence building, but it does specifically talk about um, voluntary um, information exchanges while protecting confidentiality of information. So I would say overall, the summit introduced um, the relationship between information and confidence, which I think is positive, uh, but it remains to be seen exactly how this is going to be implemented. Third, employing voluntary actions to enhance the summit. Clearly, paragraph 20 in the communique, specifically on voluntary actions, completely new, very useful if implemented. Um, in addition, the trilateral initiative identified additional voluntary actions beyond the IAE recommendations that other states, uh, that the states that signed up to that could take. Um, so I think this idea of voluntary actions is something that got off the ground at the summit, but again, we have to see how it's implemented. There's nothing in either of these documents that requires specific demonstration of, of performance. So we're going to have to watch this closely. And fourth, peer review and best practices. That's been in the communique from the beginning, and it was in the trilateral initiative 
uh, as well. However, I want to make two points about, about the peer review part of this. First is what, the, what is being talked about in peer review is what's called IPASS, which is a physical protection assessment by the IEEA and a particular state that is confidential and can be released or parts of the information can be released, but it's not necessary. It is not what is done in nuclear safety, which is a requirement for countries to provide documentation on their safety and then submit it to their peers for actual review, um, which also is confidential, but also can be made public. So it's not the same. There's a difference still between safety and security in this regard. Uh, secondly, the best practices for all of the reference of best practices are, again, undefined, what specifically these best practices are. And there's no one size fits all, I think, in this area. And we have to really tailor them to individual countries. So I think we ended up at the um, end of this summit with a good with something that's worthwhile, but something which is really just the foundation of what needs to be done. So I think that A, the summit took the uh, need to improve the regime seriously as an issue. It is something that was, I would say, the seed was planted at the Seoul summit. It was completely not referenced in, uh, as an issue in the, in the Washington summit. The seed was planted in Seoul, and I think the seed has grown um, in The Hague, I'm very happy about that. Uh, but second, it began the process. I would say if you signed up to this trilateral initiative and you actually fully implement it, you have the beginnings of what are international standards for nuclear security. So I think the implementation of this particular initiative is actually quite important. Then I just want to talk about other terms that are in these documents, in the communique and in this trilateral initiative, that are interesting to me and I think useful and new. So there are references to demonstrating implementation. I think that's going to be a very key thing. Taking regional actions. I think obviously on a regional basis there's much more that can be done um, than just through the summit process. Very important in a trilateral initiative. Nuclear security is an international responsibility in addition to a national responsibility. Up to this point, the focus has all been on the national responsibility. And in this initiative, there's a focus on the international responsibility, which I think is very, very significant. There is an endorsement of the concept of continuous improvement, also something which hadn't been talked about in detail before. The call for excellent and transparent behavior. That, can you believe it? The word transparency is in there. Excellent and transparent behavior. And also, what I also consider to be one of the key things in the trilateral initiative, a call for the assessment of new ideas um, to improve the regime overall. So I think all of those are positive developments. In addition, I think what the trilateral initiative did um, is that it separated the nuclear security summit states into two categories. Uh, 35 signed on, 18 did not. In the 18 that did not sign on were Russia, China, India, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan. So two declared nuclear weapon states, two undeclared nuclear weapon states, and two new members of the nuclear club in coming years. And I'm not quite sure what the rationale was for not signing on, because all this um, initiative really did was require you to say, yes, we agree with what the IAEA is recommending and we will implement it. So how this issue plays out in the future, whether states decide that they want to join after the fact, um, I think is something that we'll be looking at. But I think what it does do is it, it kind of separates the countries into those that are more serious about this issue and those that either have to explain why they didn't sign or you have to assume that maybe they're not as serious as the ones that did. And so what we've been trying to do through the summit process is not point fingers at countries. But in a subtle way, what the trilateral initiative did is it gave you kind of a photo negative of those that are seriously committed and those that seem to be somewhat less seriously um, committed. And of course, we don't have the national statement, so we don't know uh, why. But all of this, in my opinion, raises expectations for something more in 2016. 
Uh, and this is really the key issue. I think that the, there has to be a concrete connection between this summit and the next one, uh, and especially on this issue of governance. And I think that what the Hague Summit did is it built a platform uh, that's very stable and that can be built upon uh, to try and eliminate the gaps and the weak links that exist in this system. What the summit didn't do is eliminate the gaps and the weak links in the system. What it did do is set up those issues for progress coming into 2016. Um, and I think that that, if the president is serious about achieving and moving ahead rapidly, that's where I would focus a um, significant amount of attention. So in my opinion, I think that uh, if that's the way the summit in 2016 goes, I think that Obama will have a legacy um, worthy of the cost and the effort and the expense of, of this summit process. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, all. Um, uh, I wanted to remind everybody to please, we're going to start the question and answer period. Um, please introduce yourself, say where, uh, where you work, um, and are there any questions for our panelists? I can start us off if, uh, if nobody has anything to ask. Um, I was interested, so Ken, you talked a little bit about this idea of a political versus a technical process and how it seems like uh, they're going to try to maintain some of the po political mom momentum. Um, can you and perhaps our other panelists talk about why that's important, what you know, each of those brings to the process? Yeah, I mean, th you know, the summit was started because there was a, I guess, obvious need to try and do more than what was being done through the existing channel, which is the IEA channel, which is actually quite important. And as both Sarah and uh, Sharon laid out, I mean, a lot has been accomplished that otherwise wouldn't have been accomplished if there wasn't a summit process. So having a political um, process, I think, makes a difference because you need people at the top to tell people further down the chain what it is that they want for their next meeting. These are forcing events. You have to deliver something. That's the benefit of summits. And neither of you have it. Okay. Um, uh, I'll be another friend. No, there's Wave a for the mic. mic. Thanks. Jennifer Mackby, adjunct fellow here at CSIS. So I was wondering, as Sharon mentioned, the, not, the whole goal has not been accomplished within four years and won't be by 2016. So what might be the plans afterwards? I've heard various possibilities either in the IAEA or Ken just mentioned at a ministerial level. And <coughs> who is focusing on that? Thank you. Well, um, you know, that phrase, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, that um, even though the four-year goal uh, I, I thought was pretty clearly articulated, um, some in the administration say, no, 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 there never was any four-year goal. Uh, and besides which, you know, what did that refer to? The most vulnerable material. And so the question of what's the most vulnerable material is also up for debate. You know, is it HEU, is it plutonium, is it, you know, I, I mean, even when we started all this whole process, I think it's difficult to remember that, you know, really the Europeans found radiological sources a much bigger concern because if a terrorist was going to, you know, would a terrorist make a nuclear weapon or a dirty bomb? Um, you know, so there are still a lot of, um, you know, differences of opinion. I think those, those gaps have closed somewhat. Um, but I don't think you can say it's this amount of material and, you know, the IEA should work on that. Um, I'm a little probably less confident in um, the, I, I, I mean, let me back up for a second. The IAEA must be involved, absolutely, and they have a lot of expertise. But they are not a leadership organization. They typically uh, implement the policies that their member states want to pursue. So for an example, on centers of excellence, um, 
I have suggested and many other people have suggested that these centers of excellence should cooperate. Well, the IEA says, yeah, we think that's a great idea. And when they ask us to cooperate, we will certainly help them. But they're, they're, they're not a leadership. Uh, organization and so that's why these summits that's exactly what these summits have provided and the question is when you go forward what takes the place of that we are a little luckier in the for example the convention on nuclear safety because there's a review process that is built into the convention this is one particular item that the nuclear security architecture regime whatever you're talking about is lacking so if you don't have a review process, whether you do it at a summit or you do it states parties or something like that, how do you know what's going on? How do you know where the gaps are? Did I answer your question or did I go <laughs> off on a tangent? <laughs> a little bit, okay. Well, I would, I'd like to add um, just about the, the role that the joint statements might play in this. Um, you know, it's a much more micro level than the sort of, you know, macro architecture, what is this entire system going to do going forward? But these joint statements have provided a little bit of an opportunity for individual states to show leadership in particular areas. And as we've seen that they were, some were updated in 2014 and had new sign-ons, those might be part of what, you know, it's, an, it's probable or, you know, at least possible that some of those activities will continue beyond the 2016 summit regardless of what um, whatever sort of high level political um, you know process is maintained so there is an opportunity there the summit has provided a little bit of um, you know a laboratory environment for some new cooperation and some new cooperative activities that that have different states cooperating on particular things Jennifer let me just make one point we now have I think with the end of the Hague summit, the full scope of nuclear security finally inside the envelope. It took six years <coughs> to get it there, but I think we basically have almost virtually all of it in there. 2010, the focus was just on fissile material. 2012, because of Fukushima, you got the focus on safety security interface and the focus on facilities and radiological. In this one, I would say that, you know, the, besides the Japan announcement, the number one thing is on the regime. And so I think now you have inside the envelope everything that you need. So the, whatever the administration's view or the president's view was of this thing in the beginning is OBE because it's much bigger than what it was in 2010. And so the responsibility and the obligation and the leadership challenge is also much bigger. And that's what needs to be risen to at this point, because you're only going to get one more at bat, okay, before all the heads of states, you know, devolve this down to who knows which minister will end up, probably the Secretary of Energy or the minister, Energy Minister or somebody like that. So I think they've got, this is teed up perfectly um, for this administration to do something significant in this area, now that the entire scope of the issue is inside the envelope of the, of the summit. Um, back in the, uh, yeah. Thank you, Deborah Decker with Stimson Center. Um, two questions. Who was it there that you might like to have been there? You mentioned, for example, Belarus. And also, was there a discussion of the fact that the Ukraine had had that given up their materials and? You know, the British and Americans witnessed the agreement with Russia on that, and what, what were the discussions like surrounding that? that? So that's the first question. The second question was um, on forensics, which was emphasized in one of the earlier summits. Uh, no one except for the Dutch app seemed to be talking about that, and I know this summer there's going to be an IAEA conference on that. So what discussion was there surrounding nuclear forensics and attribution? I'll just say a word about Ukraine. Ukraine dominated the, the event. I mean, there was no question about it. And the good news was that everybody was able to say, well, it's a tragic situation, but at the very least, there's no nuclear material, no physical material left in the country, no warheads left in the country, and that's a very positive thing. I do think, however, that the Ukrainians themselves are a little bit nervous about their nuclear power reactors 
um, in an environment where you know there's threatening uh, part of their territory has been occupied and there's a threat uh, on the border to the eastern um, part of the country. So I, I would say that the, what the Ukraine did is a it made clear the value of prescience in politics by taking action when you can. Okay, when the opportunity arises, seizing it to get rid of all those warheads, missiles, and the fissile material that was in that country. And secondly, it raised also the uh, question of, are your threat scenarios for all of your nuclear assets um, as relevant as they could be, or are they just designed for peacetime? Should they be designed for potential hostile environment as well? Uh, I'll just say on the forensics, the, the, the Dutch um, gift basket was really a culmination of three years of activity. Um, the first time that, my understanding is that the first time that the idea for this activity and the cooperation came out of the March 2011 Sherpa meeting. And so this has been an ongoing activity and there are, um, there, there are four priority areas and I can't list them for you off the top of my head right now. But um, that, the, that the countries that have signed on to that um, are continuing to cooperate in training. Um, the, there's, an edu there's a curriculum that was developed. So there's, there is certainly ongoing activity. Um, it is you know, a relatively technical uh, topic. So it's, um, I'm not quite sure all of the channels that it's being sort of fed into, but there is a, there's a continuing level of cooperation in that area that's, that started actually back in 2011. Do you want to say something about who else should be there? Uh, yeah, let's do the follow-up. <laughs> uh, Ken, on the Ukraine, I was listening yesterday to the Senate Armed Services Subcommittee hearing on um, and, uh, that discussed emerging threats. <laughs> um, well, actually, it was really interesting. One, one, one of the um, things that came out was, like, what country is going to give up their nuclear material and potential after the Ukrainians did and hey, you know, wouldn't Russia have been thinking differently about them if they might still have had material? So um, that was what one of the senators asked and, uh, and uh, Kenny Myers refused, he said, no, that's not my thing, go ask policy. The policy shop said, can I give you a written answer on that? So. This is, this is your tax dollars at work. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, so, well, please I, let me pass the buck. I don't agree with that. I mean, I think it's good that it's not there. I don't, certainly don't think that you want to encourage countries to have a nuclear deterrent because of, you know, the, 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 it, it wouldn't have, w what would they have done? Fired a Russian nuclear missile at their own country? I mean, I don't think that that, I, I sincerely doubt that what, the, that what happened in Crimea would have been different if there was fissile material in Ukraine. I'm happy it's not there during an unstable s political situation because that is what worries me more than anything is political instability and then political complacency. Those are the two things that worry me more than you know whether or not a guard has a gun. Um, in the back. Uh, I'm Carlton Stoiber. I'm now uh, chairman of the Nuclear Security Working Group of the International Nuclear Law Association, so I have a sort of a legal uh, perspective on this. So I'm going to make a statement disguised as a question. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you talked about the architecture, the regime, and it's clear to me that there are the two aspects of that. There's the national aspect and there's the international aspect. On the national side, you had uh, paragraph 11 in the communique, which uh, recognized this uh, implementation kit for national legislation that was submitted by the Indonesians uh, with participation by Verdict in London. And I worked on that. And I would say that one of the important things for the next uh, summit, and I hope you agree, would be to adopt some kind of assessment mechanism for determining whether or not states are indeed uh, adopting and implementing effective national legislation because regardless of what the international regime becomes, the first uh, line of defense in this area is going to be national law and national implementation. The second paragraph of the communique that I'd like to point to is 16, 
which is talking about the IAEA and its role in continuing to assess and monitor what states are doing uh, in the uh, nuclear security field. And the real problem, I've been on many of these uh, missions uh, in, the, in the security area, and the problem, quite frankly, is resources, both human and technical and financial resources of the agency in order to, to be able to conduct these. Do you see any uh, appetite uh, beyond this very uh, vague statement in paragraph 16 of the, of the communique on, on really beefing up the IAEA's capability to conduct these kinds of activities in the nuclear security field? Well, I, I, I would just say this. It is they have received additional money in the nuclear security fund as a result of the summits. It's probably not adequate. They have elevated the office inside the bureaucracy and they're getting more, I think, out of the, out of the regular budget than they did in the past. But it is related to your first question, which is how many of these assessments do you want? They're not mandatory. They're voluntary and should it be the other way around? I mean, I think that's the question. Shouldn't there be an obligation to do this as opposed to opt out of, of doing it? But I think, Carl, all of this, I mean, you, you know, this is a really, from a kind of macro perspective, this is really an interesting point because the question is, at the end of this, are we gonna end up with essentially the same system, but we have this stack of, of um, specific outcomes which are useful but hasn't really changed the psychology of the game? Or we're gonna come out with something that says, hey, you know what, the price of doing business is higher than it was before this all began and we ought to take that on as part of our, our responsibility as nuclear operating states. I mean, I think that is a fundamental question which is not answered at the moment. I, I would just add to that, Carl, <clears throat> I wouldn't put all my eggs in that IEA basket, <laughs> particularly on this, um, but there are other avenues. So the US, I know, does a lot of bilateral work with countries, and then there's the connection to UNSCR 1540. So, um, you know, I would, I think you gotta promote it all, right? <laughs> um, the problem is you can throw a bunch of money at it and you can have, um, you know, teams go over and draft laws. I mean, you've certainly been part of those for a few countries. Um, but the bottom line is when, you know, is the, is the national capacity and building that national capacity. Even once you get the laws, I mean, law, writing the laws is one thing, and then it's the question of implementing them. And you, they go from law to rules, regulations, to implementation, and so, um, I think that's an outcome of this broader, you know, political support. Yeah, this is important and we're going to spend some money on it and we're going to seek out uh, assistance where we can, whether it's through, you know, some countries prefer the IEEA because they feel it's more neutral or they just, um, you know, are more, just feel more comfortable uh, than looking to uh, bilateral relationships. So I think you got to do it all. Well, I want to thank Sharon for mentioning the Convention on Nuclear Safety, which I wrote, <laughs> and that uh, includes the review conference mechanism, yeah. and I think that's one of the approaches that, uh, that might be fruitful in this uh, line of thinking, is to adopt for, for either new instruments or the instruments that now exist, a mandatory review process in which states have to come forward and really demonstrate what they're doing. I could not agree more. I would also add, you know, if you had something like a secretariat, I mean, we have the OPCW, we have the, you know, a, a, a real secretariat that could provide you know, those kinds of resources and assistance, et cetera, uh, you know, would be an improvement. Paul? Microphone's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm Paul Walker with the Green Cross International and the Fissile Material Working Group, too. So thank you all for nice presentations and for being, I think, very fair, maybe a little bit overly fair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, defining the glass as half full as opposed to half empty. Um, I, I particularly want to reiterate, I think, something you brought up, Ken, and that is in three areas, really, the scope has expanded, I think, very importantly, uh, bringing in military 
uh, when the majority of these weapons-grade materials are military stockpiles in both the United States and Russia. Secondarily, bring in uh, radiological materials when, in fact, all of us are very concerned and continue to be about uh, dirty bombs and, <coughs> you know, uh, radiological bombs. And then thirdly, really the fact that we've begun actually what I sometimes use as the M word, mandatory, as opposed to the V word, voluntary. And so we've started talking about mandatory, you know, minimum standards of security and safety as opposed to voluntary minimum standards. And I think that's one of the most enormous challenges in all of these regimes uh, we face. So two quick questions. Uh, nobody has really mentioned Russia. Has Russia, except for the Ukraine back here, uh, <coughs> has Ru did Russia issue a statement and did Russia join the trilateral initiative? Uh, I don't think so, as far as I know, but maybe not. Uh, but I think that's important to note. Um, secondly, uh, two of the very important, you know, physical protection and anti-terrorist regimes, the CPPNM and the ICSANT, was there anything in the final communique or anything in the national uh, statements uh, that focused on ratification and entry into force and strengthening these two agreements, which uh, still remain in limbo because of a lack of a number of countries not joining them? Thank you. Sarah, I know we're, okay. we're still sorting through everything, yeah. but. So um, Russia did not sign on to the trilateral initiative, but um, they are, they were, they did sign the global initiative, they're part of the global initiative to combat nuclear terrorism, which had a joint statement in 2012. That statement had an update in 2014, which they did sign on to. So um, I do think it's important to remember that a lot of those channels, despite the high-level attention that the the, um, the Ukraine issue obviously got, is getting generally and got at the summit, there are those channels that, that are remaining. Um, but they did not sign the trilateral initiative. What happened on Xant and CPPNM? I don't think there was any specific I don't statement. Think so. On that. A lot of countries okay. mention it. Here. Sharon. Okay. So, so Ixamp, I don't see in this communique, mm -hmm. but I also don't have my glasses on. Um, <laughs> on CPP and N, I, I thought the statement was actually fairly positive, uh, which it said, we will continue mm -hmm. to work towards the entry into force of the 2005 amendment later this year, 2014. Mm -hmm. Now, that would require the U.S among others, <laughs> to, uh, to ratify it. Um, I didn't see the Russian statement, but as Ken said, Russia was not part yeah. of the, what we call the trilateral, uh, trilateral initiative, the strengthening uh, mm -hmm. nuclear security implementation. Mm -hmm. um, and I the real question is, you know, moving forward to 2016, mm -hmm. what's going to happen coming out of Crimea and Russian cooperation on a whole host of different issues, but they are clearly a key uh, player here whose cooperation we need. And a lot of the countries do, and I will admit to having not read all of the progress reports yet, there are a lot of them, but um, a lot of the countries do sort of lay out in specificity their plans for implementation or for um, ratification of the treaties in their progress reports. So have to, you can sort of judge who's where in the process. There's a lot of, we're thinking about it, there's a lot of we've done X, but we need to do Y, and so it's a little bit more to sort out. Actually, can I ask a follow-up question to Carl <laughs> Stoiber? It's, a, it's an international legal question. So there's a, uh, once a state signs a convention but is awaiting ratification, are they bound to abide by its provisions? No. Because there is a statement in here that calls on the need for all contracting parties to comply fully with yeah. the The rule is uh, under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And the rule is that uh, the signatory of, a, of an international instrument is not strictly bound by its provisions, but it is bound to not take any action that, it, that would jeopardize the objects and purposes of the, of the instrument. So this does constrict the options for signatory states that have not yet ratified n not to move forward with inconsistent actions. And that, that in, the, in the arms control area can, can be fairly powerful, actually. Thank 
Thank you. Uh, any more question questions? Do you guys have any uh, concluding comments that were brought up by the question and answer session? No? Well, thank you very much for your participation in the panel. Uh, it was a very interesting discussion. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Leslie.